I'm Carl Lamborg. I'm an associate professor in ocean sciences, and uh, my research is around the biogeochemistry of mercury and the environment in general. And Younger Lagoon is just a really terrific uh, backyard natural laboratory. Um, studying effects from the ocean and groundwater and runoff from agricultural fields, and so it allows us, it's a, it's just a great system for us to sort of test out some of our hypotheses. Hey, I'm Nettie Calvin, and I am studying natural mercury in the sediments of Younger Lagoon. Um, and my interest is to see which areas and conditions are right for methylating mercury, so to compare that as a ratio of the total mercury there that's present, and then to examine what proportion of that is methylated, and then try to find a correlation between other parameters. The overall goal of the project is to identify like the region, if any, that that's ripe for methylating mercury. So we're collecting both sediment and pore water samples. So the pore water is the water that comes in between the solid sediment. Um, and I'm going to try to build a model that connects different parameters like nutrients, sulfide, oxygen, um, temperature, pH, and salinity and see if there's connections or correlations between like if the mercury that's present is getting methylated or not and then the other parameters that might be going on or combinations of those parameters. Mercury is a neurotoxin but ionic mercury isn't the form of mercury that's going to go into tish, fish tissue and bioaccumulate. So when mercury gets methylated by sediment bacteria, it becomes more oily, and that's when it can make its way into the food chain and start to bioaccumulate and become a problem for animals and people. Um, so that's why we're particularly interested in what conditions are right for mercury to get methylated. Because mercury that's just coordinated with organic matter and buried in the sediment isn't really doing anything. So it's not as dangerous as it is if it becomes methylated. Is the pH probe even in there? I didn't put it on okay. there. Because I, I checked it but yesterday to see. Yeah, I have the little what, cap thing in there. Perfect. It just says minus 9.999. Yeah, yesterday I left, or maybe the day before, I had it in like calibration <coughs> and stuff, and it was negative the whole day. And then finally it crept all the way back to 0 0.01 negative. And I was like, what? You're almost at zero. Oh, that's funny. That's the saltiest surface we've seen in a while. DO is dropping, but it's mondo high at the moment. Mm. A couple hundred percent. Yeah, well the algae is not totally dead. I mean, it's not as healthy as it was a month ago. Yeah. There's just a big spike of nutrients in during the rainy season, but it's not warm enough. When things grow up. Maybe we'll see low nutrients now or something. Lower. Then there's maybe a mid-summer spike when more Goes on. Who knows? This is a piezometer, so it's like a straw that you can take down into the sediment, and we ordinarily sample at two meter resolution. Today we're just collecting water just above the sediment interface, um, so I can compare that with the surface. Second. I guess we that? can. Let's do that, okay. because that way if the, if the first one will know that was sort of the... Right. The flushing. Uh, the flushing. Okay. So I'll do that. You've already numbered them. Which is okay, good. Um, I'll just fill them up in order. Okay. In numerical order. I remember when I was in the analytical chemistry class in school and we carried all these bottles of water to the field to be the method blanks because they would like go along and be subjected to all the same procedures. And it just seems so funny to all of us. Right. <laughs> taking this water out, right. out for a ride. Out for a ride in the cooler. <laughs>
So I'm interested in how they evolve in response to predators and other environmental factors. Um, and so I've done some surveys of fish across many estuaries like this in the region, but I also uh, take repeated samples here at Younger Lagoon to see whether traits are evolving in a predictable seasonal pattern. So um, these guys have a kind of a lot of uh, defenses against their predators are small prey fish, and so one of the easy ones to look at is these bony armor plates, and some fish have a lot of bony armor plates, some fish have few. Um, and here we think there's a seasonal cycle whereby during the summer, in the lagoon, there's not really many predators around, and so they're selected to be more low plated. And in the winter, when the lagoon connects to the ocean, then many of the fish go out into the ocean when there, where there are a lot of predators present and during the winter we see we're starting to see some evidence that there's actually selection in the opposite direction and so this kind of push and pull we think explains why younger lagoon and many sites like this are um, diverse why they have a lot of different armored genotypes and phenotypes whereas many populations of this fish in other parts of the world um, are monotypic they all look the same so here are just a few of the stickleback I caught this morning um, it is, trying to see, it's the breeding season right now, and there's a handful of males in breeding color. Here we go. So these, most fish are kind of silvery, that those might be females or they might be non-reproductive right now. Whereas this guy is a male um, in breeding condition, and so he's got this bright blue eye, he's got this red on his throat. Um, these are signals both to the females and to other males. Uh, I'm Becca Fenwick. I'm the director of environmental IT for the UC Natural Reserve System. And today I am a drone pilot uh, collecting data for the reserve. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Justin Cummings. I'm actually working as a technician and assistant with Becca on the drone flight. Um, so this is the drone we're going to be flying today. Uh, it is called a Matrice 210, uh, and it is uh, pretty new. We bought it just before Christmas. And what you'll see here is you've got these four propellers, which keep the drone in the air. These are GPS antenna, uh, so that the drone knows where it is really accurately while it's collecting the data. And then on this side, you'll see uh, the two cameras that we use to collect the data. This is the multi-spec camera that collects uh, information in the bands of red, green, blue, near-infrared, infrared, and thermal. And then this is an RGB camera, much like you would use on your phone or anything else, just to collect um, beautiful imagery that we can stitch into a 3D ortho mosaic. So this drone, uh, this time, will fly uh, across the lagoon, and when it's flying, it'll be flying in what we call a lawnmower pattern. So back and forth across the arms of the lagoon, and then all the way down to the coast. That will give us about 4,000 images, give or take. And then all of those are stitched together. They have an 80% overlap, so you can put them together and create a really large image of just the lagoon and survey area. And then that can be used for all kinds of scientific research. So one of the things that we need to do with the drone imagery is actually calibrate it so that even though you're taking data in different light collect conditions, so maybe it's slightly cloudy, maybe it's a bit brighter, that you need to be able to compare the images flight to flight and day to day. And the way we do that is using a calibration target, which you can see on the ground here. That's a very specific gray square that's next to the QR code. And we take that image uh, using the multi-spec camera and then the software, when we process it, uses that target to calibrate all the imagery so that the values you see in the data is the same. Um, and then one of the other important features of this drone is its ability to know where it is in space when it's taking the data. So I mentioned the two gray antenna on top of the drone as the GPA, GPS antenna. What happens is that those actually talk to this antenna that you can see over by the greenhouse over here. And then this is effectively a really high accuracy Trimble GPS unit, but is for, built specifically for the drone. And it's in continual con contact with the drone while it's flying and tagging each of the photos with a, a geo referencing point. So each photo knows where it is in space uh, within a, 
about a centimeter and a half accuracy. And so that allows the data to be stitched together and give you this beautiful author mosaic, which is all the images together in space, exactly where it should be when you put it on the map or bring it into ArcGIS. So with the drone data, what we can do is what, with the research project I'm working on, we're looking at how water moves through an ecosystem. So not necessarily water in liquid form, although that's how it starts, but as it falls through precipitation and hits the soil, how does it get infiltrating into the soil? The soil keeps, gets moist. How do the plants use that moisture? And this is something that we can see using drone data. So using this multispectral camera, you can actually get a product called NDVI, which is akin to plant productivity. Uh, and it's a ratio between the near-infrared and the red band spectrums on the, on the drone itself. And this tells us how healthy the plant is, how active it is. Is it super green and photosynthesizing really well? Or is it just leaking out? So like this, like this. It's a different color green, so it's like a little softer green. Or is it dying and it's actually more yellow? And this is directly tied to how healthy the plant is. And that's one of the things we can pull from the data. We can also look at the thermal imagery because when things have more water, they're cooler because they're transpiring or the water is evaporating. And so by looking at variations in the thermal characteristics of the plants and the soil that the drone flies over, that gives us some indication of the amount of water that is there and how moist the, the ecosystem is. So the drone is controlled by this remote controller here. Um, there's an app that we use on here called DJI Pilot, and that actually uh, controls the drone while it's in the flight and also sets up the, the flight lines and the survey lines for us. And so what you'll be able to see on the screen here, hopefully that shows up, um, is that these are actually the flight lines uh, that we'll do as we survey the reserve as it goes backwards, backwards and forwards. All right, so we turn it on. I'm Michael Loik, Professor of Plant Physiological Ecology and Climate Change Ecology in the Environmental Studies Department at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm standing in front of one of our long-term climate change experiments here that's part of what's called the International Drought Experiment. It's a multi-site global climate change experiment designed to test the impacts of extreme drought on ecological patterns and processes in particular, biodiversity and uh, productivity, how much plants grow each season. We actually have three experiments built into one here. Uh, one of them is part of that global network that has a proscribed design for the rainout shelters that you see back here. And that's part of a global comparison, uh, comparing ecosystems and locations in about 70 locations around the world. We have side by side with that a, a restoration ecology experiment asking the question what is or what might the effects of uh, drought be on our ability to restore these coastal grasslands. And back in 2016, we planted uh, 1,600 individuals from 12 different species on open control plots or under these drought shelters. The drought shelters are designed to intercept 60% of the ambient rainfall and channel that away off the plots. Uh, and then each year we measure who grows and how much growth occurs. Uh, and the planted plots, um, I have a graduate student who is monitoring the survival and the traits that uh, are favored by those plants that uh, may help uh, lead them to survive better under the drought conditions. Hi, I'm Justin Loong, a graduate student in the Loiken Hole Labs in Environmental Studies at UC Santa Cruz. I'm particularly interested in learning how to improve restoration methods and planting success given future changes in precipitation patterns. I'm also interested in how evolutionary relationships or phylogenetics can impact restoration planting success. In order to figure these questions out, we planted 1,600 plants from 12 different native species 
in ambient rainfall plots and in these drought shelters. And then I tracked their survival annually. I also measured functional traits and surveyed the plant communities to figure out if there are specific traits related to plant risk of death or if community change could be explained by changes in plant traits. Functional traits are essentially any plant characteristic you can think of that are quantifiable, measurable, numerically, or categorically. In our study, we're specifically related in drought-related traits because we're concerned about changes in precipitation and we live in a semi-arid region where water is often the limiting resource. As such, we selected specific leaf area, leaf lobeness, leaf carbon nitrogen ratios, and leaf delta carbon 13, a proxy for water use efficiency. In drought, you might expect plants to have lower specific leaf area, higher leaf carbon nitrogen ratios, higher leaf delta carbon 13, and higher leaf lobeness. We found that drought effect significantly affected drought communities. Specifically, drought communities had greater perennial grass and forb cover and lower non-native grass cover. We also found that the changes between ambient rainfall and drought plots were significantly explained by plant traits, especially leaf carbon nitrogen ratios and leaf lobeness. Hey everyone, Alex Krohn here from the North Center for Natural History, UCSC's very own Natural History Museum. Recently, uh, I led a team completing uh, a year-long resurvey of all of the biodiversity at Younger Lagoon. And so um, these UC Natural Reserves are amazing natural laboratories for, for researchers, for scientists, but they depend on us having a really good understanding of what is present and what is present where on the reserves. And so um, not only that, but they also provide a really cool way to kind of gauge how biodiversity is changing across California. So if we look and we, we compare how biodiversity has changed at all of these reserves, we can kind of infer how things might change across California. And so uh, we did just that. We, we went and collected the baseline data uh, to tell how Younger Lagoon is changing. And so we went back and we, we tallied up all of the species, and I mean like plants, bryophytes, fungi, insects, reptiles and amphibians, mammals, birds, all of them, uh, and saw which ones had been vouchered and which ones hadn't been vouchered in uh, over 20 years, and went back and resurveyed and tried to find uh, every single species present here on Younger Lagoon. And um, for example, for reptiles and amphibians, we found uh, three species that had never before been documented. We did a large insect uh, inventory where just looking at morpho species, we had about 400 species that had never before been documented at Younger Lagoon. And so this was cool because it kind of set a baseline against which we can, uh, we can measure change. So we were really meticulous in, in our methods, making sure that they were repeatable and that people could, could follow up um, 50, 100 years from now and repeat our methods. And they could come back and they could see how insect diversity or reptile and amphibian diversity has changed over time. And we at the Natural History Museum kind of take biodiversity data, both in the forms of specimens and in the forms of, of species locality, and we try to make those accessible to anyone who wants them. So we try to make all of the, the specimens that we have publicly available, we try to preserve them for hundreds and hundreds of years so that they will be accessible for anyone who wants to study them. Anyone who wants to learn about the biodiversity of Younger Lagoon can come view the specimens that we collected and do their own research with them um, and, and on whatever topic that may be. Uh, otherwise, if we take photographic data, um, we are part of organizations like uh, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Informatics Forum, um, I forget what the F stands for, um, that, that again stores all of those data, including eBird data, iNaturalist data, and data from museums and, and makes them publicly available so you can search them and you can really uh, learn 
about the biodiversity of Younger Lagoon from the confines of your living room, from your computer. And so that, um, that's really the purpose of this, is taking the resurvey data that we gathered and making it available to everyone so it's immediately searchable.